Okay, I think it is time to talk shit about Blizzard again. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I haven't seen, uh, I've seen like the features, obviously. I've not seen the whole panel because it's 40 minutes. Uh, so far, honestly, I'm not gonna lie. Everything I've seen from Blizzard, from BlizzCon, you know? So, uh, just so you know where I'm coming from, I'm not too impressed. Maybe there's something in here that I missed, but honestly, let's be real. If they don't change the endgame content, I mean, it doesn't matter if they have the extra expansions. The endgame content is still fucking garbage. Right? Obviously, this doesn't matter to people who are like, Oh, well, I'm just uh, mount farming like a fucking degenerate. Then it's like, then it doesn't matter. Like... I honestly can't understand the people who are like, well, I think the game is fine because all I do in it is pet battles and mog farming and mount farming, like old world mount farming, not even like current, you know, cutting edge, AOTC mount farms. Like some people didn't even, like I saw a post, and like people don't believe me when I say I never even touched the, um, the great vault, the weekly great vault. And I was like, it, does, it doesn't matter if they believe you or not. You shouldn't have a say about the end game, Because you don't care about the end game. Anything is good for you. You have absolutely no standard from the game. And it doesn't matter what... Like, Blizzard can make, like, the most amazing end game or, like, the worst end game. People like that will not play in it. So it doesn't even matter what their opinion is. I can't take those people seriously. I only want people who play the actual end game and have an opinion about it. That's the only people you should listen to when you're designing the fucking game. If any, if if you're listening to anyone, that's the people, the ones who are actually who actually want to do end game. But right now, <laughs> end game is fucking dog shit. Anyways, that's uh, I think that's enough for an intro. Uh, <laughs> let's get to it. Here's our first presentation: World of Warcraft. What's next? Four years have passed since the mortal races gathered together in Anaheim, California. <laughs> and now, the drums of BlizzCon thunder once again. Let me hear the thunder! <laughs> yes! Oh, ah. in oh, thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the World of Warcraft What's Next panel. My name is Taryn Gregory. And as maybe you may have heard, <laughs> thank you. As, as you may have heard from Probably Chris one of the during only the people opening, Blizzard who still does their job properly because the cinematics are really fucking good. Ceremonies. We are at the dawn of a new era of Warcraft, the World Soul Saga, a the story that will play out over so the next far, three like the expansions and will take us on an adventure in World of Warcraft like we've never experienced before. This, this saga up. kicks off with the War Within. In this first chapter, our heroes will be called on an expedition to the subterranean depths of Azeroth, revealing a new world full of mystery, wonder, and darkness. There, we will confront the shadows below and face new challenges on the battlefield, as well as in ourselves. So what is next? What's that even mean, as well as in ourselves? It's like this whole, like, Miss of Pandaria shit that never really happened. Ooh, confront your own fears, your doubts. Ooh, the shout of anger. Ooh. Yeah, it never, it never felt that way. It just felt like I'm just killing another fucking bug. During this section, I'll share an overview of the story of the War Within, and then next you'll hear from the, uh, Maria Hamilton, who will speak to zones and cultures. And then wrapping up with Morgan Day, who will talk about dungeons, the raid, and our new systems. Let's dig in. In our cinematic reveal, did you guys uh, enjoy the cinematic? <laughs> Woo. Big shout out to the cinematic team for the work on it. I really hope that that cinematic is just the teaser for the expansion and not the actual expansion cinematic i know like that it's probably like Im fucking possible but i really hope so i hope like that part where you're like the anduin thrall cinematic is sometime like you do the beginner quest and then like you stumble upon anduin and then the cinematic plays like in outside of Silithus or whatever that's what i would hope i hope this is not the actual 
like expansion trailer like it's like, like <laughs> it's like two dudes talking nothing warcraft about it really but whatever on that it's just incredible work um ah, we witnessed as thrall found anduin rin who has been wandering alone for the last few years grappling lost in his own thoughts and dealing really when did he leave the mall by the way like how come no one knows about this oh he was traveling alone for the last few years he was supposed to be in the mall for the last few years as far as we knew i i heard that there was like talks about like oh Anduin should also be out of the mall by the time we go to dragonfly but like it was not i don't think it was ever told in game he just pops up in Silithus. okay cool with the experience that he's been through as many of you may have remembered Throughout this and our features trailer, we learned two very important developments, starting with these visions. Thrall spoke mm -hmm. of a vision calling out from the heart of the world, like a voice from a dream. This the Radiant Song Calls. Oh my god. Yeah, and I don't want to say they're like stealing from Final Fantasy fourteen, whatever. But I mean, a lot of... And uh, honestly, overall, I don't even mind if they do. Fuck it. Still the good aspects, use them, make them your own only fine with it but like at the same time it's like it's like they're not even hiding it this radiant song will compel our heroes to investigate its origins and while at the same time a darkness has been gathering even as the heroes adventured on the dragon isles and in the war within the mysterious harbinger that aridicron spoke of will reveal themselves zalatath has returned wow. <laughs> freed long ago from the black blade that once found don't, her i don't understand the hype about around Zalatath. Maybe everyone else and their mothers play the priest and they liked her whispers. It was uh, Zalatath was not like that big of a villain in a sense. I mean, it, she opens the path to a story, yeah, but it's like she's not that hype. Like I don't I don't know what people are like so hyped about with Zalatath. She is now the harbinger of a new era of the Void's dark machinations. And her yeah. message is clear. The Black Empire has fallen. The old gods are dead. And their ancient blood runs deep within the cracks of the world. No one cares, though. Why does it matter if the old gods are dead? What we care about is that there's, like, a ton of other void-corrupted worlds and void lords and all that shit. So it's like, who gives a shit if the old empire fell? There's, like, the void lords are still out there. Void is still on Azeroth. It's like it can re-manifest itself, like it's not like, oh wow, the old gods are dead, ooh. Well, Zaltath is here, she's not dead. World. We, the heroes of Azeroth, destroyed them! <laughs> the forces of the Horde and the Alliance have proven time and again they are among the most powerful armies that have ever stood. The Harbinger has watched this. She is patient. And while the Black Empire failed, Zalatath now seeks to set in motion the rise of a new dark legacy. One that knows our true strength and will seek to test it against a new threat of terrible power the Nerubians of Ashkehet. Zalatath has conscripted the Nerubian queen Anserek, having offered her people a new future, one in which they will rise from their isolation as a mighty kingdom once again. And here in this sprawling city of Ashkehet, we will not find the undead soldiers of the Lich King that we faced before, but instead a new mighty stronghold of the Nerubians as they once were, deadly survivors of the mythic wars that have played out time and again over thousands of years. Like, okay, so here's the thing, right? So Zalatath's supposed to be like this pretty smart, I mean, she's an old god, whatever. She knows we defeated four old gods, right? Fought off a fucking titan, kind of, right? Um, destroyed the elementals. Um, you know, fought Deathwing, okay? Uh, you know, destroyed the, the Shah, right? Um, what's his face? Uh, the, the one true war chief. Okay, uh, Garrosh, and it's like, yep, yeah, Nerubians, the Nerubians are gonna be the answer, yep, mm-hmm, yep. In return for their loyalty, Zalatath has granted the Nerubians the means of a dark evolution, uh -huh. one that will turn the Nerubians into a new kind of ferocious and terrifying soldier that we will clash against time uh -huh. and again in the War uh -huh. Within. Now let's yeah. talk about who we'll be adventuring with. How do you like the key art? <laughs> yeah. Several of Azeroth's greatest heroes will rise to the call of the Radiant. So I got Alaria, I guess that's Anduin based on the sword, and I think that's Thrall in the back. Okay. Song, and many will be faced with their own unique challenges. 
Anduin, having survived his deal or deal with domination. Yes, look at the art. Oh, incredible artwork. Anduin will be grappling with his relationship to the holy light that he no longer feels worthy of, while Thrall is seeking a connection to like these Anduin. visions, spreading across the world and working to find his new place in the Horde, while Magni Bronzebeard, long the Speaker of Azeroth. Bro, what do you mean? Dude, how many fucking uh, spiritual uh, explorations does Thrall fucking need? Like, oh, I'm the war chief. Oh, I don't want to be the war chief. Oh, I don't want to be the war chief. Ah, let's make a council. It's like, ah, now I have to find myself again. Like, fuck. Oh. We'll confront the heavy weight of that responsibility once and for all. Yeah, champion! The wounds, champion! Yes! <laughs> but that brings us to, I know you saw this in the uh, features trailer, uh, Alaria Windrunner. Alaria's uh -huh. journey will be central to the events of the themes of the War Within, as she, a Void Hunter, will use all of her prowess to hunt down the Harbinger while being torn between her own nature and the maddening call of the Void to which she is attuned. Along the adventure, she will have a unique rivalry with Zalataf, whose twists and turns will come to define the nature of this new conflict. Of course, we'll see many more familiar faces on our journey and meet a host of new and interesting characters along the way that Maria is going to tell you more about in just a moment. But finally, this saga is only just beginning. Conceived to be... <laughs> yes! Conceived to be an epic worthy of the first 20 years of World of Warcraft, the World Soul Saga aims to Heroes. redefine the storytelling in our expansion I'm set. I'm sorry, I, like, I cannot... Anyone who goes to, like, a con, I can't find them as, like, a normal person. Like, I don't know what it is. Just... Boldly <laughs> just... at the core themes that define Warcraft. The might of heroes, the responsibility of that power, the pursuit of justice. Got to do my best Mets in there. Justice! <laughs> and the importance of finding common ground as well as ourselves amidst adversity. Up next, may I introduce Maria Hamilton, who will be sharing more about our zones and cultures in the War Within. Thank you so much. This will be the boring part. Oh, God. Hello, BlizzCon. Oh, wow, I am no, so excited to be here no and delighted today, to represent huh? our team and tell you about the places that we will explore and the cultures we will encounter in the War Within. I can't really see all of you out there. I know there's a lot of you, though, because I can hear you. And I hope to hear lots of oohs and ahs when you see some of this cool art I've got to show you. So let's get started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yep. Yeah, thank you. Okay. As Taryn mentioned earlier, we'll be called by the Radiant Song, dreamlike visions that come from the heart of the Azeroth. This summons is going to lead us to the subcontinent of Khaz al -Gar, a place long forgotten. <laughs> In the middle of the fucking ocean. Not even like under Silithus or whatever, it's just in the middle of the ocean. Like there's just going to be a hole in the water. It, <laughs> it's only through recent explorations in Oldemon that we've discovered a Watcher report concerning a contingent of Earthen that was sent to this place long, long ago to investigate a fissure in the sector. What exactly that means, we don't really know, but we could probably speculate. So first, let's talk about the Earthen. Ooh, ah, there you go, there you go. All right, we have met Titanforged Earthen before, of course, in Ulduar and other places, but this society of Earthen has been isolated within Khaz al -Gar for a really long time and have developed their own manners and customs. Now, visually, these Earthen are a bit larger in stature, and they're noticeably blinged out. They've got gems all over them, bedazzled, blinged out, you know, that kind of thing, right? But philosophically, they are guided by the Edicts of the Titans, a set of codified orders, duties, and expectations that provide instructions for the core functions of their society. You know, Titans, order, all that, right? Mm -hmm. But the Titans have been absent for eons, and the Ursin are no longer united in their adherence to these Edicts. They now exist as three groups that are estranged from each other. The Oathsworn, as their name suggests, still uphold the Edicts faithfully and believe everyone else is doing it wrong. Their charge is guard guarding the Coreway, a Titan passageway that leads right to the core of Azeroth. They're primarily the city dwellers. They live conveniently near the object of their responsibility, that core way, to the surface that allows okay. player Earth and will replenish the culture's dwindling numbers. And they join either the Horde or the Alliance. Yeah. It is, of course, player's choice which side you wish to ally with. But as you can see from a small sampling of... And they find themselves trapped Doesn't here matter. within Khaz Algar. Again, this is the concept art. Priest, Paladin, let's see. So, is it the first ones? Yeah. So, probably Paladin. Fuck, I don't even know. I mean, could be male, honestly. This is leather, this is cloth. I guess this is male, I don't know. So, paladin, male, whatever. Um, I guess rogue, daggers, this, that, and obviously a priest. I mean, I, honestly, like, the priest and the paladin monks uh, concepts are better, that's for sure. Uh, as a Let's people, see. the Arathi are brilliant people abilities through their after cool below. I, I, Lenting, like, the threat is dire, this... and the Arathi can't hold much longer. I legit don't, like, this, none of this fucking matters. Let's be real, like, some backstory that you will not even find out about, like, 
too much in the game you'll have to read a fucking story with a back ground on it like i don't care within the iraq culture here in the deep darkness as taryn mentioned earlier zalatath has made a bargain with the nerubian queen ansarek yeah. and queen ansarek has embraced these modifications with enthusiasm and all nerubians yeah. maneuver this nerubian kingdom introduces us to a variety of citizens including yeah, some we're form super scared of some nerubians yes we've never encountered before here's a layout of some of the nerubian models that are completed and also some that are in progress as well as scale reference for Nerubian goblin gnomes and humans, okay. Nerubian murlocs. Fuck, I don't even know what that is. Or goblins into the kingdom. I, I don't know. I guess. Dorn. This is the home of the earth and surface dweller. Nourishment yeah, yeah, yeah. volatile Square site, houses. understandably yeah. protective of their hide. They choose to serve them. The unbound yeah, deal with hostile yeah, creatures from time. Triple yeah, homes are whatever. often situated in the lair of other creatures. The city of Dornagal is the located amenities yeah. of the capital. capital. Yeah, that the yeah, earthen yeah, are engaged yeah. in their work in accordance with the edict. and forges, and is both the response of to the okay, islanders and creatures cool. that do not typically dwell in capital working. Well, to take it to be yeah, a no, bunch of like and from the ringing deeps. If the, the edicts are be to be a tenuous foothold and with a high platform of merit in battle with Oberon, the slight stuff, warmth in that direction, matter. reliable flame beacons. In the absence of this, the Iraqi sun has one been changing in recent years. This is the one that toward the light and seem to be reaching in that direction whenever they're in Hollowfall. Unfortunately, the crystal sun has been changing in recent years. Where once the light was steady and reliable, it now fades without warning, plunging the Arathi into darkness, save where they have built light towers and maintain their holy flame beacons. In the absence of this light, the dangerous Kobis and other fierce creatures emerge from the sea to rampage. As the Considering it turns from light to void, it has to be like a type of Nerubian... Um, fuck do you call them? Uh, wow, what do we call them? Um, type of Naru. If it turns, because it's like, I believe only Naru is turned from light to void. It's not like you can just like turn light into void. Like, it's like the Naru is, I, I don't know, honestly, like, whatever. They can come up with anything. Rathi right are now. barely this holding back the Nerubians. These unpredictable episodes are incredibly demoralizing and deadly. Happily, the light has always returned to the crystal so far. Anyway, as areas those anyway. Nerubians pass places deep in the decades and other histories, but the key skill attack the threat of forces of the darkness and odds for about our zone flow. As I mentioned, awesome, huh? And then into Ashkahet, in the war for the seamless green deeps Dragon and hall of fall. As you can see, we built for dynamic flight, and we were able to flow directly between the zones without the load screen. There yeah, they're gonna have to make every expansion from now on, um, like that, basically. So. There is some seriously amazing swoopy goodness to be had <laughs> moving fine, across these but... zones and through these spaces. It feels so cool. It's gonna to be burn like here's. Here's my problem with them having now they have to design for Dragonflight. I bet more and more zones are going to be similar to the zone where the Centaurs is, where there's like absolutely like almost no mo mobs anywhere, and it's just like open fucking field, and just gonna feel like empty as fuck. There's no purpose to any like it doesn't even have like you can put like a bunch of animals or whatever sure beasts but it's like there will be no purpose in that area it would just be oh we're just gonna put some elephants here why because well we can't just have it an empty spot but it's like how many points of interest are there in any one map two or three everything else is kind of like dead zone i really don't like that first out of a really tight area and into but again huge... i don't really care about the overall world, I think the world in the World of Warcraft is pretty much dead content anyways. Yeah, I know some people are only doing world content. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, like, they, like... Like, they would play anything. Let's show that. Like, they, like, it doesn't matter. Like, those guys you can take away the world content, they're probably not gonna quit the game. Like, it's, like, they'll just run circles and dollar in. Drop like that. It, it's so exhilarating. Now, this blobby map mm -hmm. that I've got up here was an early attempt during development of our zone flow to try to figure out how we would stack these zones together and achieve mm -hmm. the relationship between their geography and geometry that made sense and felt great to traverse. We mm -hmm. ended up with something slightly different than this, but this is pretty representative to explain what the world builders were thinking about when they planned these spaces out. It was really up, important to down, our design that down. while three of the four zones are technically underground, they didn't feel that way and that they were distinctly different from one another. We pursued that goal by introducing the natural cenotes in the ringing deeps and leaning into the fantasy of the classic underground foundry and industrial workspaces. So even in the zone that felt the tightest, there's places that look as though they're actually on the surface. 
And within a hollow fall, we created a massive hollow space in a cavern so vast it feels like an exterior with a huge artificial sun in the form of a gigantic crystal. And in Ajkahet, we leaned hard into traditional Nerubian architecture with hanging nests and huge palaces built all over a decaying city that just falls away into the depths. And that is the last bit of eye candy I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this peek at what we've got in development. Okay. So, Smart and Dave, please talk to me about Endgame. Dungeon raids and systems. Let's go. Hello, BlizzCon. Show me Mythic Plus changes. My name is Morgan Day, and I'm here to talk to you about some of the upcoming content, features, and systems in The War Within. I'm sure I'll also make some funny faces that I'll regret later in thumbnails, but whatever. <laughs> First up, let's talk about dungeons. There'll be eight, oh. There'll be eight new dungeons coming in the War Within, four during level up, one in each of the four zones that okay, Maria just walked standard. us through, as well as four at max level. There's a lot of really cool stuff happening in these dungeons. For instance, we have like a I'm kobold sure. dungeon where you'll meet that candle king, where there's like a light mechanic that takes place. You have to kind of keep it going to, to light your way. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a dragon riding dungeon, of course, uh, but also one of my favorites is like the Cinder Meter. the dungeons having these uh, mechanics, like, uh, I don't know what to call them, but like specific mechanics to the dungeons, basically similar to Vault of, um, not Vault, was it Vault? I don't know, the... The Legion dungeon with the uh, Wardens, the Warden Vault, whatever. Vault of the Wardens, maybe? I don't know. Something like that. Whatever it was. So, like, that light mechanic was pretty cool, in my opinion. Like, that, that would help you with the last boss. So, I want more mechanics like that in dungeons. However, because of Mythic Plus, they can't make all uh, so many mechanics. Like, for example, I love the idea of the maze in Ardenweald. Like, the, dun the maze dungeon. But, because of Mythic Plus... I hated it, you know, but as an idea, it's good. So it's like, how do you put this in a mythic plus without it being like either too easy or too time demanding and people will not like the dungeon. The whole problem with mythic plus is that, right? That's why like having the timer and all that shit, not a good idea in my opinion, but we'll see. That Maria just talked us through. So this is a dungeon that takes place on our first zone, the Isle of Dorne, uh, which is where you'll experience you know, all of our earthen buddies, and this is the place where they make that cinder brew mead that she was talking about. You know, they're mm -hmm. taking all that honey that they gather from throughout the zone to make the mead to do all kinds of fun and or nefarious things with. Sure. Uh, although I do have to say, I feel like they're a little bit behind the times. I feel like all the kids are drinking that you know, hard seltzer or something these days, but whatever. <laughs> they're old school, I get it. Next up, mm -hmm. our raid, fun. the Nerubar Palace. So this is an eight-boss raid that will take place in the zone of Ajka. He's definitely not comfortable being on the stage. Which is fine. I mean, neither am I. But, like, yeah, he's, like, moving around side to side as much as possible, trying to, like... Uh, and this is really the culmination of all of those machinations we keep hearing about that we see play out between the Nerubian Empire, their queen, and her collaboration with Zalatan. The amount of, like, the amount of his eyes move and, like, the amount of movements he makes. And, again, I am looking at this at, like, 1.5 speed, obviously. But, like, he's talking really fucking fast. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of the one point, maybe he's talking really fucking fast. So for this next one, uh, we don't normally show things this early, but I thought it'd be cool to share. Uh, on the left there, you can kind of see the top-down view of the raid, and on the right, it's more of like a side cutout. Uh, so we like to work on all of our dungeons and raids when they still look like this, as it's much easier to iterate uh, while we're in 2D than it is to kind of change the zones around. On the 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 bosses. 8 bosses raid. Okay, so less content, yep. Yeah. And again, as much as I don't care about i mean used to care but like i the the way they design raids i don't like it i hate wasting nine hours of my day on like fucking half of it being just like mundane shit um so yeah i mean i'd rather be able to just queue into a boss right and like there's a story mode for the raid and that's fine but when you're doing bosses after like the first story mode like normal mode, yeah, sure, do it as in story mode, whatever. Get the get the you know the atmosphere going, whatever. I don't like it's fine. Heroic and mythic, bro. In my opinion, no trash. Fucking just boss rush that shit. Just fucking queue into a boss, kill the boss, queue, get out, queue into the next boss. Like fuck that shit. Like straight up. Round once we're in the game and it's all blocked out. I don't uh, have so time step for us through the really quickly. This uh, after raid. barging through the front door, uh, you'll the very quickly time. fall and/or get knocked into one of those giant Waste pits of, of that black blood of the old god that you'll hear much more about in Ajkahet. Uh, and then you'll batter your way through the harvest pits, and then finally traverse your way back up through the stalactite wing, which is not a final name, I promise. Uh, until you finally f fight your way into the queen's inner sanctum, where you'll come face to face with her as the end boss. Um, so as you can see, this will kind of feel like a winged raid in terms of the vibes, but in, in terms of the player experience, it'll actually be quite a bit more linear than what you might be used to for a raid with some winged vibes. Uh, so something that I also think 
think it's fun to talk about really quick is um, with all of our dungeons and raids, we like to try to explore like what is this, the thing that's going to make this space feel really unique, that's going to make it stand out from all the other times that we've built in these dungeons and raids. And with this oh. space, we really thought that you know, given that we have the Nerubian to play with, they've got all these amazing like webs and th silken threads that you can kind of traverse uh, the zone through. We thought it'd be really fun to explore verticality as a major element of this raid. Uh, so I think that'll be really fun to see what the team comes up with for that. Next up, let's talk about systems. Uh, <laughs> Please talk about systems. So I want to walk you through some of our features and systems at a really high level, but first I want to talk about some of the philosophies that are really guiding us to add these into the War Within. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, you know, we really want to continue to extend the philosophies of Dragonflight into the War Within. And really when we talk about that, there's three main pillars that I want to touch on. First, you we really want to make sure that we're focusing on evergreen one? features. We want to make sure that we're making World of Warcraft better forever and not focusing on things that we know we're going to have to leave behind as we move into future expansions. Like all of your gear? Like the talent specializations? Next, uh, we want to make sure that there's something for everyone. So whether you're a hardcore raider, a PvPer, a collector, or apparently like Holly, you just love to play tons of alts and run around the world exploring things. Uh, we yeah, those guys, yeah, stop building the, like, don't even build the game around people who just do world content. They'll be, they'll be happy with anything, like, it doesn't matter. Don't, don't waste too much effort on that, like, those people have, like, absolutely zero standard for gaming, so it doesn't even matter what you throw their way. Just put a bunch of, like, fucking corkies around the world, and they'll look, oh my god, look at these corkies! Fucking idiots. We want to make sure that there's something in War Within that I'm you can really geek out so, over and that resonates with you. I'm so and finally, like, I'm we want to make sure that we're continuing shit, to build man. on our I'm philosophy so and build on our shit. systems and content with people who play multiple characters in mind. We want to make sure... Uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we're building all of our systems to really respect the time of the player behind the keyboard and not focusing so much on the accomplishments of that individual character. Again, proof is in the pudding. And so far, I don't think Dragonflight has delivered on any of these, like, uh, green, evergreen content, whatever. Like, where's the evergreen treasure dungeon, whatever they made? Well, that's kind of useless now, isn't it? It's like, oh, but the talents are evergreen. Bro, the previous talents were evergreen. Oh, but the dragon riding is evergreen. Bro, the previous flying mounts were evergreen. They didn't add any 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 evergreen stuff. For me, evergreen would be like rework Torghast to be fun, have its own little challenge, its own little scaling. You start with like zero item level and it's like based on the power-ups that you get is what you will become. Right, and make it like a le have a leaderboard and all that shit, and does does not give gear. Okay, and it's not gear related. Then we can talk. Until I see something like that, like the, the, there's no evergreen content in the game. So let's talk about delves. Uh, delves are a new feature that will be integrated into the outdoor world experience. Where the fantasy of these is actually that you'll be joining the Dragon Scale expedition in their search for lost treasures all across Kazalgar. Mm -hmm. So delves are an evergreen feature that is really integrated into the outdoor world experience. We want delves to be a new pillar of endgame content for those outdoor world explorers. Uh, so delves as an evergreen feature is not that the previous delves that they would come that would come out with this expansion are going to be forever relevant. It's that. From this expansion moving forward, they'll keep introducing new and new delves. It's like calling Mythic Plus an evergreen system. I mean, technically, you are right. But you're also going to be erasing all of the previous delves from relevancy. I mean, kind of still the same problem. Uh, we really view this as something like when we added World Quest back in Legion, uh, where they are going to be really integrated and transformative into that outdoor world, especially that endgame loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so one of the main reasons I'm stoked about those is that these will provide an opportunity for us to, you know, give seasonal content and reward. Evergreen feature. Next line. Oh, it's seasonal content. Okay. One of the main reasons I'm stoked about those is that these will provide an opportunity for us to, you know, give seasonal content and rewards to those outdoor world explorers. So that means things like, you know, rewards that you're used to, like mounts, achievements, titles, but we'll also be adding a outdoor row mm -hmm. to the Great Vault with War Within. Uh, so that all of you outdoor world explorers will be able to share in the joy of, you know, rushing to the Great Vault every week to collect your loot. Uh, and there will also be 13 unique delves that we'll be launching War Within with. 
Uh, and Delves will scale from 1 to 5. First of all, in my opinion, they should remove the fucking Great Wall. Like, straight up, remove this fucking RNG atrocity from the game. No one likes the vault. The only time people like the vault is when they get, like, the item that they really want. Which is majority of the time, not the case. Majority of the time, you get boots and you're happy. And then, like, the next five weeks in a row, you're gonna keep getting boots. And you're like, what the fuck am I getting boots for? I don't need boots anymore. That's the vault. You know what would be better than the vault? Give me a currency based on the amount I did of, co of content I did the last week. Currency for delts, currency for raids, currency for uh, Mythic Plus. Okay, that's in the PvE bracket. Give me currencies for that and let me go buy the gear I fucking want. There. That's the vault. Done. By players and be role agnostic. So oh, that means if you want to play a solo. Spawn. But what about the dopamine hit when you're like fucking getting the item you want? I'd rather w be able to target the item I want. Even if it take me, takes me two weeks of like maxing out my vault in Mythic Pluses to get the max reward for the currency, and I can go and buy the fucking item I want, totally fine with that. That's totally cool. If you're gonna go with you and your partner, that works as well. Or you can bring your whole dungeon group in, and del the delve will scale based on your group size and your roles. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention one of my favorite features of Dells, which I think Maria alluded to earlier, which is that there will be an NPC companion joining you on all of your adventures. So for season one, that'll be Bran Bronzebeard, as you can see. And Bran will be tagging along with you on all of your Delve adventures and will totally never, not even once, aggro a pack of monsters that you didn't want him to. And I don't have my fingers crossed behind my back right now. Uh, so Bran will have a custom... Brand will have a customizable uh, talents and mechanics and abilities uh, that you'll be able to kind of load out to suit your playstyle and needs. So, you know, maybe you need a little bit of extra healing. Uh, well, you can load Brand out to provide that for you. And finally, um, you, you know, wouldn't be exploring it with the Dragon Scale Expedition if at the end of every delve there wasn't this massive treasure trove that we need Brand to open for us, which hopefully brought a couple of keys to open some of the chests in there. Uh, but before Brand can open that treasure, that vault for you, you'll need to maybe defeat a, a boss, maybe you'll solve a couple puzzles, something like that, and then Brand will be able to open that vault door for you. Next up, let's talk about one against this content as a whole, but I think this is the content, the Delve content is fine. <laughs> like, where does it fit in the world of Warcraft, though, endgame? And ah, it's happening! <laughs> So Warbands are a system that we're introducing that will really be the representation of all of your characters across the I really account. Like, in my opinion, Delve should not, again, shouldn't be gear focused. Like, maybe very minimal gear for, like, world content sh stuff, but, it's like, I don't understand why there's a vault for it. Like, what the fuck? Why, is it, why are you giving me a vault for that con? There's no way it's competing with Mythic Plus, right? And again, you can make it, like, just a scalable thing, right? So it's, like, it would really depend, like, how much effort you put into developing your uh companion to be able to succeed in it rather than how strong you are and then you can just solo it without caring about your companion right if anything delve should be revolving around the the companion system and not around not having the companion revolve around you well what if i'm a protection paladin right who does massive aoe doesn't fucking die can just pull everything together like, do I really care what Bran does at that point? It's like, oh, well, he can do a bit more DPS. Like, <laughs> who cares, bro? Uh, you know, Warbands are an opportunity for us to create a platform where you can share your achievements, resources, and all that other good we'll stuff see. across all Again, of We'll see how this goes. I don't have my hopes up for Delves. I think, in theory, it could be cool, but, like, realistically, I highly doubt it's going to be, like, good. It'll be fucking scenarios all over again. Characters. So the goal of this system the is really to be that representation of the philosophy shift that I mentioned earlier about really respecting the time of the player behind the keyboards and not those individual uh -huh. characters. Yeah. Um, there's actually a ton of additions and modifications. We talked about a few here. Um, there's no like singular UI screen that says Warbands. Uh, it's more of like all these modifications and updates and, and features are like kind of wearing a big coat that says Warbands on the back of it. It's, it's how I kind of keep it head in my, uh, straight in my head. Uh, but just to talk about a couple of those cool features, um, we'll actually be revisiting the um, transmog rules of how you acquire those those appearances in the About fucking time. I have this stupid set on my paladin that was meant for priests that I got in BFA, and I couldn't trade to my priest because it's binding pickup, and I couldn't use it because I'm wearing plate. Maybe now I can wear it, except I don't even play it, but whatever. About time.
the war within. So for all of you who have, So that means all of you who have probably had to run four characters through all of those legacy instances just to make sure you're collecting all the appearances, uh, that won't be the case anymore in War Within. You'll just be able to run it with one character. Cool. Again, it's uh, a good and, quality oh, yeah, of life. Uh, Don't get Holly me mentioned wrong, this already, but... but this is obviously one that people... It's like, a lot of these are like... Bro, this is like... This is like a hotfix. This is not... This is not an expansion feature. It's like, ah, mugs are now... You can use any mug on any... Okay, cool. Where's the expansion feature? <laughs> This is like a hot fix. People are looking forward to uh, all of our reputations as well as renown in the War Within will be shared across your entire account. Uh, last but not least, let's talk about hero talents. Uh, so here's a quick mock-up of what the UI will look like that I think really helps explain how these integrate into our current talent trees. Uh, but really quick, let's take a look at how this will work. So there will be three new ta uh, hero talent trees per class, and two will be available per specialization that you can freely choose and swap between. Uh, and also, so this is another is general feature. This is a system that we think is going to provide a new vector of choice and customization for you and all of your classes, as well as create opportunities for us to really... And here's the problem with this one. Now, again, cool, that's a nice idea. Does this system stay after, uh, after the next expansion? No? So it's going to be a similar to, um, what is it called, Borrowed Power? And again, I never had a problem with bar power. I always had a problem with acquisition of bar power. I think the bar power systems overall were fine, giving you new abilities, changing the way you play a bit, shit like that. I think that was fine. I think acquisition of them was always fucking dog shit. So knowing that this one you'll pretty much just get by playing the game, not doing anything special, is a good thing. However, if this is, and this is the problem that a lot of people have with bar power, if this is a borrowed power that goes away with the end of the next expansion, first of all, wasted content, wasted development time. But second of all, you will you feel weaker leveling in the next ex in the expansion that's coming after the next one when you lose the these uh, talents. Dig into some of those core class fantasies that are you know so amazing. Uh -huh. So here, talents will introduce these new, small, self-contained talent trees, like you just saw in the UI. And the way I like to think about it is like, currently we have two types of talent points, right? We have class talent points and specialization talent points. And now in the War Within, there'll be a third type called hero talent points. So let's look at a quick example, which hopefully explains it a little bit more. This is a warrior, as you can see. These are the three hero talent trees that they'll have available, Mountain Thane, Colossus, and Slayer. And as you can see in the top left, we have Protection, who will be able to choose between Mountain Thane and Colossus. Up in the right, you'll oh, see Fury. Yeah. Yep, that's right. So Mountain Thane and Slayer general, are their options. And down at the bottom, Colossus and Slayer are their options. So this is how the majority of our classes are going to look in the War Within. The exception, dish. of course, being <laughs> Druids and Demon Hunters, who are a bit special, so there's a look a little different. So let's take a look at how you'll unlock the system, as well as how it'll feel playing through as you're leveling through the War Within. Uh, so the system will automatically unlock at, at level 71, and it'll just kind of appear in your UI. You'll earn one talent point per level as you level from 71 to 80. And there are 10 talent points in total with several choice nodes along the way. So I like to think of this as being similar to like the Legion artifact where as you were leveling and progressing, you were making some choices along the way, but ultimately you're gonna unlock the whole tree. Uh, and also I wanna be very clear here, these are uh, extreme. Why do you unlock the whole tree though? That was the problem that made the artifacts not as interesting because you would just unlock all of them. So now it's... Oh my God, bro. No, make it a choice. Extremely low friction to swap between those choice nodes as well as to swap between the different hero talent trees. So, you know, this should be very analogous to your current talent trees and will follow all the same rules that you used to there. So, you know, the start of a raid boss, you know, before Mythic Plus starts, before an arena match kicks off, and anywhere in between. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to wrap us up, I wanted to show off a really quick video of what hero talents look like in action. So this is a warrior, as you can see, popping avatar, jumping in. And this next one is that same warrior with the mountain theme talent tree. As you can see, Stormbolt hits multiple targets. There's a couple of cool new V effects and a lot of other cool stuff going on there as well. I heard some oohs. Ooh. <laughs> our effects artists will be happy. So that about wraps us up for our What's Next panel. That's it. Okay, so no changes. We hope you really place. liked what you saw here, and if you'd like to know more, please join us tomorrow at the Deep Dive panel where at noon, where Ian will walk you through some of what you saw today in more detail, Ooh, Ian! as well as a bunch of other cool new stuff in the War Within. So thank you all so much. I hope you have a great BlizzCon. Anyone interesting here? No. Bye. Okay, my thoughts, honestly, like really, like, this whole... I can't believe people are paying money to go there and sit there and like I feel like they're just self-hyping themselves to not tell themselves that they just wasted like four thousand dollars on going to BlizzCon. 
if if not more i'm like i think i'm under like undervaluing by a lot when i say 4000 yeah it is people aren't happy with blizzcon 2023 seems like some people let's see real quick People aren't too happy with BlizzCon. What? What's this? Feedback, BlizzCon 2023 was disappointing. For contact, yep. a partner and I have been the last five BlizzCons. This is by far the worst one for many reasons. Okay. Yep. Uh, disorganized, poorly executed, getting to the convention Friday morning, absolute nightmare. Line blocks down a harbor. Unlike previous years, it didn't close down adjacent streets for safety and proper line management. I mean, this is like, this person's like generally entire convention felt disorganized and poorly executed. You could just feel it. Uh, portal pass, absolute waste of money. I mean, yeah, I could have told you that. Uh, partner and I was... Yeah, I don't even understand why people took the... For, oh, it's like a VIP thing. Private viewing, launch, private... Okay, that's fine. Extra thousand dollars we spent for literally nothing. Straight up uh, being routed with general entry. The demo and gameplay experience is... Oh, this is plural. What's he saying? Uh, we're just a few consoles loaded up with Overwatch 2. No other demos, just one. Single experience, not plural. The viewing lounge was... Well, no, I don't... Is, no, I don't think that's true because um, you were also able to play the se uh, the season of Discovery, right? Streamers only? No, I think they announced that you could play it in the hall. Like, it, not just streamers. Uh, viewing Lounge was small and not large enough screen to really enjoy it. Viewer meet and greet, developer meet and greet were never really posted until today. It was just random. Food was meh. I could, t I could have told you that. Uh, the advertisement mm -hmm. was the past, was that there was more, and there was no more. The above was it. So basically, BlizzCon was a lot smaller. I didn't even go this year. I could tell something was really off. Why is the main stage in the arena? Uh, why is Community Night on day two? It really screws with cosplayers. Where are all the esports? Been six years. This year is definitely the worst. Well, there's a lot of people that aren't happy about BlizzCon. It seems like uh, it seems like this is a very common thing. Uh, the last time I went to BlizzCon was 2018, and I only met, went there to meet a hot girl. And so, uh, you know, I didn't even really mm -hmm. spend a lot of time at the convention. Yeah, I don't know if people go to the convention. That's why I said, like, I can't consider them as normal people. Like, you just don't go to conventions if you have a brain. Like... <sighs> Shit. This has nothing to do with what I said. It doesn't matter. Anyways, yeah. Uh, my thoughts on this content, honestly, completely not enough for an endgame player. If you're like, again, if you just love raids and you love Mythic Plus, it doesn't matter what they do, you're going to love the game. If you are looking for some fulfillment out of fucking WoW, that is like actual... You know, you go to actually play the game and not just run on the fucking treadmill over and over. There's nothing in WoW right now that can convince me that it's not a, just a shitty treadmill. And a shitty treadmill it is. I don't know how people play WoW for fun. There's nothing in WoW that I can consider fun right now. Overcomplicated. You need too many add-ons. It's a fucking pain in the ass on patch day because you have to wait like a day or two for the add-ons to update sometimes, like specific ones. Right? You can't play PTR because you can't put the add-ons on the PTR, so you have to like, you know, you play the regular one with add-ons, then you play the PTR and like, dude, this is just not comfortable anymore. Oh, God. Raids take too long. Like, way too fucking long. It's like, on the Tuesday when we were raiding, I would say at least like 30 minutes of the raid minimum would go away for on trash. Right? This is like a full clear raid. 30 minutes of it. Let's say, like, you know, we're just re-clearing heroic, whatever, just rushing through it. 30 minutes of that goes into trash. Like, fuck off. It's like, oh, but BOEs, yeah, BOEs went to the guild, okay, it's for money. So, I didn't even make money off of those BOEs, so, like, I can't even be motivated about the EOEs, okay? Anyways, absolutely nothing in the BlizzCon regarding World of Warcraft that is even remotely close to making me want to play it again. Maybe the story will be good, but, like, it is it is World of Warcraft, so uh, you don't really play it for the story. I know Akalon is really happy about this because he has three expansions worth of like theorizing or more like writing the story for Blizzard because they haven't really figured it out yet. So you all the lore guys are just gonna fantasize and imagine what could happen, and then the Blizzard guys be like, "Yo, that's actually a cool idea. Let's take that and play with that." so yeah <laughs> alright well yeah that's the video
as you can see i mean i didn't come with any hopes and uh i, I probably am still disappointed so uh, yeah see you in the next rant about why you should not play world of warcraft anymore unless you're enjoying it then you know whatever you have no standards but i'm glad you're enjoying yourself yeah